So these anteriors we were talking about before. So this kid is about six years old. They're getting a little bit mobile, not too much. He's got his lowers already, um, but they've got decay in them. They're no use keeping them around. So I'm gonna extract those at the end of uh, the case today. Uh, rubber dam is gonna go on and just gonna push our little throat pack a little bit. Okay, and if you're not using a rubber dam, you absolutely should. It's gonna make your life so much easier. You're feeling so much better. And it really takes literally a few seconds to get it on. So I was saying before that your clamp size is super important if you're, especially if you're planning on using any kind of matrix system, because the matrix rings, they will be button up against your rubber dam clamp if you're trying to matrix on the same tooth that you're clamped on, which is what we're, exactly what we're doing in this case. So this guy's gonna have a, uh, an MO on his last molar here, a crown, and then a distal on the cuspid. So I'm gonna go in and, and cut that and you can see um, or maybe you can't, that there's a, a fairly large decay on the distal aspect of this molar. So I'm going to go in there first. If that gets too deep, and I think that the composite's not going to do it for him, um, I'll go back in and I'll, I'll change the plan and we'll do a crown for him. But let's clean it out and see where we're going first. So... It's a high-speed 556 burr to open things up, and um, then we'll give it a little wash and a dry, and see where we're at, maybe find my explorer, and feel that area with the explorer and see how deep we are. So still lots of, lots of soft stuff in there. So before I go into my mesial, I just want to make sure that this is, um, like I said, not going to turn into something else. So I'm going to go in with a big round burr, and I want to get out that decay, see how far down we go. Not just how far down, but how wide. Because composites in kids, we need to be conservative if we want to have some success. It's not, not the same as doing a composite in an adult, where you've got the ability of the adult to um, you know, know that you've got a composite restoration in there and to maybe be a little bit more careful. Kids are, are um, ruthless. And they're gonna chew and they're gonna do things that would maybe not want your patient to be doing on your gentle dental work so so we're deep but we're not we're not beyond what's reasonable I think I'm gonna put a little bit of Theracal base down at the bottom of that um, restoration before we before we put our composite in there just to give it a little bit of a liner and a little bit of of uh, added benefits. So the, the Theracal is a calcium silicate and a resin material. And it's light care, Theracal LC, that's the one we're doing. There's a, a Theracal PT that's just come to market, and that's for pulpotomies. Uh, this is a Theracal LC, is for our liner. So a calcium silicate in resin. So we're gonna light cure that, that's a light cure material. And while we're doing that, I'm just gonna get our little bands back because we're switching back from, from our crowns to our matrices. And I, so now I'm gonna cut the MO of that tooth. The MO I know from the radiograph was not, not up my biggest area of concern on that tooth. My biggest area of concern was the distal because I could see on the radiograph and I could see clinically that it was quite, quite a deep area. Uh, the MO should be cut without too much difficulty. So again, um, we want to get down to the base, down to solid tooth. I don't want to have any decalcification because that decalcification area is going to come back to bite us. And also, I need to be able to get my matrix band in. Now I'm going to be cutting a... Um, crown onto our first primary molar here, so I don't want to cut my prep anymore for my MO, but I'd rather cut my crown just a little bit to make room for that matrix to go all the way down. Okay, so we're just going to make a little bit of a, a little bit of a space. 
so I'm not worrying about my matrix for my contact so much as I'm worrying about the matrix and the band for my um, gingival margin. So now even though these I guess are technically upside down, I like them to fit this way. So matrix band in and now my feather wedge. So our nice little wedge in place and and when you're doing that I don't know if you can see into the bottom of the box but if you look right down into the bottom of the box you should have it you should only see your matrix band and you should only see your tooth structure okay so that's in place and now we want to put on our ring with our forceps which are here okay so I'm going to use my blue ring make sure that your ring is facing anterior we don't want it facing down the patient's throat um, just wanna show, I want to point out uh, there, there's a nice nice fit so right nice and tight and now we're going to etch and bond and put in our composite so a little bit of etch around the occlusal here and it's supposed to be a selective etch technique um, where I'm just etching the enamel. If it drips onto the dentin, I'm not concerned. Uh, I'm gonna be using a uh, universal bond so that it's gonna be able to work in any type of situation I've got, whether it's a total etch or whether it's a self-etch mode. So it's really quite dummy proof. Uh, this is our bond. I'm going to flip down our light so we don't cure it before we're ready. And just flip down our corner there. And make sure that your brush is small enough to get down to the base of that restoration area. Because if you can't get your brush down there, you're not getting any bond down there. If you're not getting any bond down there, you're going to have a failed restoration. And I will cure that. And this is our flowable. So again, I'm using, um, in this case, I'm using an Estelite. It's a Tokuyama product right down to the base of my preparation here. So just a little thin layer. You know, I just want like about a 10% fill. And this is going to act like caulking and uh, fill in all of the voids. And this is our, our Omnichroma again by Tokuyama and it's been in a composite warmer so it's nice and and workable this is a universal shade so it's going to blend and it's going to take on the shade of the tooth itself so we don't have to worry about shade matching at all it's a nice highly filled material and it's it's quite polishable um, I'm not super concerned about polishing for a primary molar restoration it's not my goal is not to get a, an accurate lifelike anatomy I'm looking for a functional anatomy I'm looking for something that's smooth that's going to last this kid for the rest of the lifespan of the tooth and in this case this kid's about six years old so we need that restoration to be in place for uh, about six years until he loses that tooth exfoliates this when he's about 12 more or less okay, so I don't want him coming back with a broken restoration I don't want him coming back with with any issues with this tooth and I promise you that anatomy is not one of the issues that we're concerned about and then we're going to put a little sealer over top so this is again the next step is the uh, flowable again over top of the entire restoration just to seal everything up get those grooves all covered and give that kid some better longevity. There's some studies, some literature out there talking about uh, using sealant type material over top of your resin composites and um, how that increases the longevity of those restorations, decreasing leakage and so on. There we go, just gonna get a nice thin layer of that on top. And that was the Estelite again, and then we cure again. And we're gonna start taking that matrix band off. And get a forcep ring in there again. Take our wedge out. Some people will um, put the 
being in first, the matrix being in first, and then the ring, and then the wedge last. I like to go, I like to go bean, wedge, ring, just a preference. We'll get that out. So that's a nice tight contact. If I wasn't touching that um, molar beside it, that would be that would be a nice contact, but not our primary concern. And I am touching the molar, so uh, the contact is is kind of irrelevant in this particular case. You know, a lot of times we'll do back to back MODOs and uh, not in this case, but we'll talk about that. So just smoothing off that little marginal ridge where we've got a little bit of sharpness of my, my composite after I placed it, got the flash off, and now we're gonna go in and uh, I've got a distal to do on that cuspid. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the uh, crown. I got a little bit of flash here too. I'm gonna cut the crown on my first primary molar. I'm gonna get the occlusal going. So we're doing a crown on that because we have decay on our mesial and our distal of that first primary molar and on a primary tooth and a free surface composite uh, restoration is not going to have good longevity. We need this kid to have that tooth in his mouth without any issues and a free surface is not going to go the distance for him so we're doing a crown for this tooth here. So I just basically got my occlusal prepped up and I'm going to go in and I'm going to make a little space on my mesial so that I can visualize the distal of my cuspid without cutting away extra tooth structure. Not sure if you can see that on the camera, but we've got some decay here on the distal. So we're going to go in and make a little prep, get that decay out and keep it as conservative as possible. Notoriously, cuspids are um, a high failure rate area, so the more conservative that we can be, the better off that we are. I'm going to take that same wedge, and I'm going to put it in between the cuspid and the first primary molar just to give me a little bit of space and to maintain some hemorrhage control. And I'm going to find my etch, and we are going to Take a look at it with my mirror, make sure that we got what we need. Yeah, and we're just gonna etch and put a little bit of flowable into the distal where that carries was on that cuspid. And then we're gonna go and uh, fill that. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but while we're, while we're working, um, you can see that decalcification on the buckle of that um, first primary molar. That's another indication for a crown there rather than doing a big composite restoration. Okay, so we're curing our bond on the distal of that cuspid. And, and just a little bit of flowable. I'm not worried about getting our, not worried about bonding to my molar because I'm gonna be slicing the mesial in order to place our crown. So flow is in, I'm gonna Make sure that we're right down to where we need to be there. Okay. And we're gonna cure that. So now we're fitting our crown for our first primary molar. And I'm gonna go down and down. And that's pretty darn good. We're gonna do a little crimping maybe. Oh, and there we go. Nice fit and we're ready for some glue. Okay, just checking everything out before we put it in. A little bit of polish and some flash over here. Good. A little bit extra up here too. And same crown filled with some nice glass ionomer cement. Give it a little bit of a rinse again. And we're gonna floss. And floss down. Floss down. Give it one final little push and one more rinse. And take a little look at it. So I can't see what you're seeing. Oh, it needs some more. There's lots of glue on the uh, palatal there. 
Let it go there. Still, distal of the E. Okay, not too bad. 